Hi, and welcome to another physics class. In today's lesson, we're going to learn about impulse and the change in momentum. You've seen this equation before in my previous lesson over momentum, and today we're going to discuss this in more in detail. Before we get started, have you ever thought about the science behind catching a football? Originally, the ball is at rest with no velocity. When an object has no velocity, it has no momentum. A force must be generated and applied in order to throw the ball. Once that force is applied, the ball accelerates from rest and now has velocity. Once the ball has velocity, it now has momentum when it is traveling through the air. When the ball is caught, the momentum of the ball has stopped. Both the ball and your hands feel the same amount of force. This is known as the Newton's third law. The amount of force that is felt or experienced over the amount of time in contact is the impulse. Now there's also a technique and a science behind it. You've heard coaches say, catch the ball with your hands instead of your body or instead of your pads and helmet. There's more to it than just that. You don't want to just catch it with your hands or just any hands for that matter. You want to catch it with soft hands, soft meaning receptive, slightly bent fingers instead of stiff, straight and hard fingers or catching with the palm of your hands. Now, some of you may be thinking, what does this have to do with me? I don't play football. How does this have to do with anything? All right. Imagine that instead of a football, you now have to catch your phone or an egg or a water balloon. Without even sitting in a science class, you instinctively already know how to catch these items. You want to go ahead and increase your amount of time and gently glide it in. Jumping back to the equation. The equation for impulse is number 19 in our formula sheet. I know it looks rather long, but you don't use every single part of this equation. You use whatever you need for that specific problem. The variable for impulse is J. I know it doesn't make any sense, but it is J. The unit for impulse is Newton's times seconds. Now, the reason for this is because impulse is essentially the amount of force felt over the duration of time, so F times T. The well, unit for force is newtons, and the unit for time is seconds. So when you have F times T, those units combine, and now you have newtons times seconds as your unit for impulse. Impulse can equal a lot of other things, including the delta P, or the change in momentum. Remember that momentum is P is equal to mass times velocity, and mass needs to be in kilograms, and velocity needs to be in meters per second. So the units for momentum is kilograms times meters per second. And of course we have mass with final velocity and initial velocity. Remember that those little letters, the F and I are simply subscripts and they're there to identify what you're talking about. Let's do a quick recap on momentum. The variable for momentum is a lowercase p. Again, this one doesn't make any sense, but it is what it is. So the lowercase p, is momentum. The M stands for mass and the V stands for velocity. Remember that the unit for mass is kilograms and the unit for velocity is meters per second. Therefore, your units is kilograms times meters per second. All right, jump into equation 19. Again, that's J or impulse is equal to force times time is equal to delta P, which is the change in momentum, which is equal to mass times the final velocity minus initial velocity. This equation is called the impulse momentum theorem. This is the scientific or the physics terminology for it, but in reality it should be called the change in momentum theorem. Now impulse is the product of a force and a time or duration over which it acts. As you notice, I have a little asterisk there for the amount of force felt or applied during a collision. So you wanna make sure that that force that we're referring to is the amount of force that is felt or experienced. Now, change in momentum, again, is represented by delta P. This triangle is the change in, P stands for momentum, is simply the difference between your final and initial momentum. So we break it down into each section. At its most basic format, impulse, or J, is equal to F times T. However, J is also equal to the change in momentum and momentum is mass times velocity. Well, since mass doesn't change, the delta P relies on the change in velocity. So it's J is equal to mass times delta V. 
And the delta V, of course, is your final velocity minus your initial velocity. Now, as we look at the top right-hand corner, we'll notice how impulse is derived from Newton's second law. If you remember F equals MA, force is equal to mass times acceleration. But when we break that down, acceleration is the change in velocity over change in time. So it's F is equal to M times delta V over delta T. And if we try to go ahead and solve for the change in momentum, we have to multiply by delta T on both sides. And that's how you get F times delta T is equal to mass times delta V. As we look at the bottom right, same thing, F is equal to MA. Again, force is equal to mass times the change in velocity over your time interval or the difference in your time. Therefore, F delta T is your impulse and M delta V is your change in momentum. Numerically, these two will be the same. The difference between the two, however, is their units. In this video, we're gonna learn about the concept of impulse and the physics of football. Credit given to Mississippi State Athletics. It's a wonderful two minute video that gets the point across efficiently. Last time we looked at how pads use pressure to distribute the force of a blow over a larger area. Well, there's another physics concept at work here called impulse. We can see how it works with a football helmet. You guys want to help me out? Sure, sir. Impulse is the force felt during a collision, multiplied by the duration of the collision. In a given collision, the impulse will be the same, but this can happen the hard way or the easy way. Be careful up there, Mr. Wynn. Uh, don't worry, I've done this a million times. Uh, if you'll hand me that melon. If the duration of the impact is short, then the force felt will be large. Ouch. Exactly. The impact with the ground happened almost instantaneously, meaning the force was very large, large enough to burst the melon. If you'll hand me that melon and helmet. The foam padding inside the helmet increases the duration of the collision, decreasing the force felt. So the melon's perfectly unharmed. It's a headbutt with a 15 yard running start. Wow. Right so, according to the physics principles of pressure and impulse, I should be perfectly safe. Obviously, that video was old. However, the information is still very useful and demonstrated in a very clear way. So thanks to Mississippi State Athletics. All right, let's look at this. Which scenario would you rather have in a collision involving your phone, glassware, or in that case, with the football tackle? Would you rather have it the hard way, as the instructor Mr. Winter said, or would you rather have it the easy way? Now, the impulse or the J is still going to be the same in both scenarios. The delta P or the change in momentum is also still going to be the same in both scenarios. The difference is, however, is the amount of force felt over the amount of time. For example, in scenario one, you could have a larger amount of force felt in a shorter amount of time. Whereas in scenario two, you can have a shorter, smaller amount of force applied and felt over a longer amount of time. So again, when you think about collisions, it's more preferential to have number two. This goes back to you catching a football, catching your phone, catching an egg, or catching a water balloon. You want to increase the time of contact in order to reduce the amount of force. And again, the same thing happens. The momentum changes, and it comes back to being the same delta P, and the impulse is still going to be the same at the end of the day. If we're looking at it as mathematically, if we'll just say that force in number one, the F, is has a value of 100, and the time of contact is one second, well, the impulse is 100. If we look at number two, we see that F is less than the original. So we can say maybe it's half the amount. So now F is 50. And in order to have the same exact impulse, the T is now greater, and it's been increased. So now it's, let's just say, for two seconds. 
So in scenario two, you have a force of 50 newtons times two seconds still gives you an impulse of 100. Whereas in scenario one, a force of 100 times the duration of one second is still 100. Here's a video by Bozeman Science with Mr. Anderson, a wonderful instructor. Uh, the full video is nine minutes. The link to that video will be in the description. We're only going to watch about three and a half minutes. However, I do recommend that you go back and watch the remainder and see the problems that he does in order to gain more experience. Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and this is AP Physics Essentials video 50. It's on impulse, which is simply the product of the force being applied times the time over which that force is being applied. And so let, let me give you a scenario. Imagine we have a baseball here that's moving from the left towards the right, and so it has momentum towards the batter. And let's say he hits it. Well, what's going to happen to the momentum? It's going to change dramatically. It's going to go in the opposite direction. What's causing that, however, is the impulse. The bat is applying a force over a given period of time. And what's interesting is that the change in the momentum and the impulse are equivalent. What does that mean? They're always going to give you the same value. And that makes them really valuable when we're looking at physics. And so let's look at two spheres that are being dropped on a table. Let's imagine that they both fall with the same velocity and they both have the same mass. So watch what happens to the first one and then the second one. And so a good question might be, which has experienced the most dramatic change in momentum? That's kind of a trick question. Since they both have the same mass and the same velocity, and at the end they're at rest, they've experienced the same change in momentum. Therefore, their impulse is the same. And so what's different in these two spheres as they fall to the table? Well, it's the time over which they interact with the table itself. The one on the right is really slowing down over a longer period of time. And that means it's applying less force to that table. And so momentum will change over time. And so if we have these two spheres, the momentum is going to be the same between each of those. The impulse is also going to be the same. What's the impulse? It's simply multiplying the force of an object times the time of that object. And these are equivalent. The change in momentum and the impulse are exactly the same thing. And so what's different in these two spheres? Well, in this sphere right here, what we're getting is a really large force over a short period of time. And this one, we're getting a really short or a small force over a long period of time. And that fact is so important that it could literally save your life. Cars have gotten safer and safer over time. And so this is a safety video. If we were to crash a 57 Chevy, an old car into a wall at 35 miles an hour, the person inside would really be hurt because it's going to come to a stop almost instantaneously. But watch what happens when this Honda Civic is driven into a wall at 35 miles an hour. Again, it's slowed down, but watch how long it takes for that car to come to rest. And so it's like that squishy ball. It's taking a longer period of time for it to change its momentum. And so we're decreasing the force experienced by both the car and the person inside the car. And so to figure out how these two are related, it's really simple. And it begins, like everything in physics, with Newton's second law, which is force equal to mass times acceleration. But let's break down acceleration, which is simply going to be the change in velocity over time. Now I'm going to take both sides of this equation and I'm going to multiply them times time. And so if I do that, what do I get? The two um, subjects of this video, momentum change, which is mass times the change in velocity, that's on the right. What's on the left, that's going to be the impulse. And these are equivalent, so we can use it to solve really difficult problems. Like could you calculate the impulse and the force on both the All right, so again, it's a nine minute video and I highly suggest that you check out the video and the link provided in the description and watch the video in full. The problem that he does is excellent. You are able to calculate for both the car and the crash test dummy. And it also shows how the delta P and impulse are interchangeable and how you can use those values in order to solve for really complex problems. Moving on to our problems, these will start out easy and get progressively harder. The scenario is we have an eight Newton force that acts on a five kg object for three seconds. We have three problems from this scenario. Problem letter A, what impulse is given to the object? Problem letter B, 
what change in momentum does this impulse cause? And problem C, if the object's initial velocity was 25 meters per second, then what is its final velocity? All right, so let's go ahead and look at problem letter A. What impulse is given to the object? So we're solving for impulse, or J. So Js are unknown. The units for it is newtons times seconds. The force that was acted on it and felt on the object was 8 newtons. You have to make sure that it's the force that was felt or experienced. And I'll get into this a little bit later. The mass of the object is 5 kilograms, and the duration of time was 3 seconds. So the part of that equation, all of equation number 19, that we need is simply that j is equal to ft. So we substitute our values of 8 times 3, so j is equal to 24 newtons times seconds. Pretty straightforward, and some of the easiest problems you'll ever get. Moving on to letter B. In this case, it says, what is the change in momentum? And does this impulse cause? So we're looking for change in momentum, or delta P. Delta P is our unknown value, and the units for that is kilograms times meters per second. We still have a force, we still have our mass, and we still have our time. However, we don't have much else other than that. So when you look at the part of equation that you need, technically we would need the M times VF minus VI. However, we have no final velocity or no initial velocity, even though we do have the mass. So it's easy for some people to say, well, we can't solve this because we're missing final velocity and initial velocity. Well, if you remember from that equation, all of equation 19, in the middle of it, J is equal to delta P. Impulse is equal to your delta change in momentum. So we had already solved for J, which was 24 newtons per time seconds. Therefore, we know the value is going to be the same exact thing. It's still going to be 24. It's just the units are going to change. So delta P is equal to 24 kilograms times meters per second. Remember that change in momentum and the impulse are the same numerical value. And this is why we call the impulse momentum theorem as the change in momentum theorem. Finally, letter C. If the object's initial velocity was 25 meters per second, then what is its final velocity? So we're solving for final velocity, that's our unknown, and the units for it is meters per second. Initial velocity was 25 meters per second. Mass was five kilograms, time was three seconds, and from the previous two problems, we found our impulse, or J, to be 24 newtons times seconds, and our delta P, or change in momentum, to be 24 kilograms times meters per second. Notice that the value of J and delta P are both exactly the same, with the only difference being the units. So the part of the equation that we need from equation 19 we can either use J is equal to M times VF minus VI, or we can use delta P is equal to M VF minus VI. Really doesn't matter because both of those values for J and delta P is still 24. So for the sake of this, I did the J is equal to M VF minus VI. So for J, I put in 24. The mass of the object was 5. Final velocity is what I'm solving for, so I'm going to keep it as is, minus my initial velocity, so VF minus 25. Now my first step is to go ahead and divide by that 5. So you divide both on the right side as well as the left hand side. Crosses out on the right and it's 24 divided by 5 on the left hand side. So that becomes 4.8 is equal to final velocity minus 25. Since we want to go ahead and isolate and solve for final velocity, we're going to go ahead and add 25 to both sides. Doing so eliminates it on the right hand side and now we add 25 to the left hand side and we get our final velocity as 29.8 meters per second. Problem number two. A 20,000 Newton truck is acted upon by a force that decreases its speed from 10 meters to 5 meters per second in four seconds. What is the magnitude of the force? I would recommend that you pause this video and try to go ahead and set this up yourself. All right, I'm assuming that you went through and set this up. So let's see if you got it right. If you see in the heading and title, it says always pay attention. So let's see if you actually got this. Highlighted a couple of different things. 
the question is asking us to find a magnitude of the force. So F is our unknown value, which the unit is going to be newtons. But it's the force acted upon that we're solving for. And as you see in the yellow, it says a 20,000 newton truck. Now, most students over the years always make the mistake of thinking just because it's newtons, it's the force. Yes, it's a force in itself, but it's the Fn or the weight. It's not the force that is felt or acted upon. There's a difference between the two. So a 20,000 Newton truck is simply referring to the weight of the truck. It's important that you're able to pick up on these details and differentiate. So we're solving for the force acted upon and finding out what the magnitude or the numerical value of the force is. That's F is equal to unknown. We have our knowns of the weight of the truck as 20,000 Newtons. Again, weight and mass are two different things. Weight relies on gravity, weight changes, mass does not. Remember my cheesy way of, but wait, there is more. Now, we got to solve for mass with our equation of Fg is equal to mg or F equals ma, which is mass times acceleration due to gravity. We'll get to that in, later on. Let's go ahead and write everything else. We have initial velocity because it goes from 10 meters per second to 5 meters per second. So initial velocity is 10, whereas final velocity is 5 in four seconds. So the time or the duration of that is four seconds. Now, in order to solve for mass, we're going to have to use our equation 9, Fg is equal to mg, or again, you can use equation 7, which is F equals ma. It's the same thing. However, remember that Fg is the downward force, it's negative, and weight is the upward force exerted on the object, and it's Fn, which is always positive. So we have 20,000 is equal to m times 9.8. Now, gravity is negative 9.8, but because mass is going to have to be positive, and it's the Fn we're referring to, I've kept it as positive. So the mass of this truck is 2,040.82 kilograms. So now that we've done that, we have all of our values, and we can go ahead and start solving this. So the actual part of the equation that we use is Ft is equal to mass times final velocity minus initial velocity. Again, F is what we're solving for. The time was the duration of four seconds. We just figured out what mass was, which was 2040.82. And we want to go ahead and take our multiply that by the uh, sum of 5 minus 10, the VF minus 10. Now, uh, make sure that you don't confuse this. There's a huge difference between 5 minus 10 and 10 minus 5. Right, 5 minus 10 is a negative 5. 10 minus 5 is a positive 5. I know it might seem a little confusing, but think of it this way. If you have $5 in your bank account and you charge for $10, now you're in a negative and you get an overdraft rate. If, however, you have $10 in your bank account and you pay for 5 bucks, you still have $5 remaining. So there's a huge difference between the two. Make sure that you write the correct VF and VI not only in setting up the equation, but also putting them in the right place in the equation. So now F times four is essentially four F is equal to a negative value of negative 10,204.1. And since we want to solve for force, we're going to divide by four. So you divide by four on both sides, it crosses out on the left-hand side, divide on the right-hand side by four as well. And now we get F is equal to negative 2,551.03 Newtons. And it makes perfect sense to have a negative value for force because force is a vector quantity, just like how acceleration and velocity and momentum are all vector quantities. Now, keep in mind that if an object is ever slowing down, the acceleration is in the opposite direction of movement. So if you think about a falling object, let's just say a skydiver decides to go ahead and engage their parachute, even though they're moving downward, the acceleration is upwards to cause them to slow down. So anytime you slow down, the acceleration is in the opposite direction. And this is why you have a negative value for the force. All right. So in the next few slides, there are several problems in which I recommend that you take your time, pause the video, solve them out. And the following slide after that, you will see the answers and how I solved them. So I believe there is about four more problems, all of which have multiple parts. So I highly recommend that you go through the next set and take your time, pause the video, solve on your own, and compare your answers. 
I hope you found this video helpful. Don't forget to hit like and subscribe and have a wonderful day.